For our lesson this week on forgiveness, we turn to the story of Joseph as found in the last half of the book of Genesis. Um, you'll notice from these readings that it's going to skip a large part of the Joseph story, and so I'll try to do my best to kind of fill in some of those gaps as we summarize here. But we're, we're very familiar with Joseph as the young man who wore a coat of many colors that his father had gifted him because it appears that to um, Jacob, Joseph was the favored son, even though he was the 11th of 12 born, one of the younger ones. Um, we read that his brothers were angry with him because Joseph had interpreted dreams where his older brothers would all serve him and that he would make himself kind of the head honcho among the rest of them. Um, and so they threw him in a pit and sold him into slavery, into Egypt. And for 17 years or so, um, Joseph lived in Egypt as a slave, uh, as a slave in the house of a man named Potiphar, who then uh, threw him into prison. Uh, from prison, uh, he found his way by using his gift of dream interpretation into Pharaoh's court, where Pharaoh actually made him the second most powerful person in all of Egypt because of Joseph's gifts, because he used the gifts that God had given him to interpret dreams to help protect Egypt during a famine, which is where we then pick up the story of Joseph's brothers then being sent to Egypt to find food during this famine, where they were reunited together. There's a lot to learn from this larger story of Joseph's lives, but I think the thing that we focus on dealing with forgiveness is is the nature of, of what forgiveness is. Um, we think of forgiveness often when it comes to people who have wronged us in some way, or people who we've wronged in other ways, right? Um, someone said something that hurt my feelings. They've you know called me names. Um, they've they've done sort of something that broke a promise, or they've hurt me in some way. Um, but for Joseph, when we look at at how forgiveness is lived out in his life, right? These are some very, very life-altering circumstances. Um, his brothers had originally plotted to kill him, and only then did they sell him into slavery. Um, you know, that, that's, that's nothing small to gloss over. For 17 years, Joseph lived his life separated from his family because his brothers had sold him into slavery. Uh, he had been imprisoned counted as less than nothing, yet somehow, through God and God's blessing, found himself with an immense level of power and authority in Egypt. And so when he meets his brothers, and his brothers come back um, asking him for food, not realizing that he was Joseph, because, you know, 17 years, he was 17 when he was sold into slavery. He, he's more than doubled his lifespan. He doesn't look anything like he did as a young boy who they sold to some Ishmaelite uh, traders. And so when Joseph comes and realizes that it's his brother, being the second most powerful person in all of Egypt, he has the ability to make their lives really just miserable. He could send them away without food. He could have them thrown into prison. He could have them executed. He could do any number of things. And I think what we learn best from Joseph is what forgiveness looks like for people who have entered into a relationship with one another that has been harmed really beyond our understanding, right? It's, it's no good when people say bad names or, or you know, break a promise to me. Um, and, and when, you know, they come and apologize, hopefully, those are things that we can, we can work around. For Joseph, his brothers throw themselves at his mercy, and what we see in Joseph is that he doesn't choose to throw them under the bus, right? He doesn't keep bringing up the fact that they had sold him into slavery. He doesn't shove in their face that, you know, he had spent 17 years enslaved and in prison and separated from his father's house. That that the people who he who that the people who were supposed to love and protect and care for him were the ones who put him in that position. What Joseph does is he looks at them and he says, what you intended for evil, what you did to me that hurt me and harmed me and, and had the potential to break me, 
God worked in and through to produce something good in spite, in spite of that evil act. Um, and so Joseph's relationship with his brothers throughout the last five chapters then of Genesis, after they've reunited and everyone knows who everyone is, is a story of reconciliation, of, of genuine forgiveness, where even though Joseph had the power to inflict any kind of retribution or punishment or justice that he saw fit on his brothers. He decided instead to love them, to mend the relationship, to, to not look at them as people who had sold him into slavery, but as, as siblings. And so then what does that mean for us in our relationships with other people? When someone has um, harmed us by breaking their promise, when someone has harmed us physically or emotionally or even spiritually, what does forgiveness look like then? And I think what we see in Joseph is that it looks like having the ability then to demand our pound of flesh, to um, make sure that everything's even, right? We, we hear often an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Um, and we remember that Jesus said, you know, um, no, I tell you, uh, if someone asks you to go a mile, you go a second, you turn the other cheek, um, you give them your, your coat and your cloak when they ask for your shirt. You know, that Jesus goes above and beyond to say, we forgive others. We, we look to other people and don't hold their fault against us, against them. Even in the prayer that Jesus taught, right? Forgive us our sins, our debts, our trespasses, the way that we have stepped across the line as we forgive others who have sinned or been indebted or trespassed, who have stepped across the line in our lives, um, that our life be one modeled by forgiveness. <clears throat> now, there are some times in life where we encounter people and we encounter things that I believe are very difficult to forgive outright. You know, if someone has been uh, physically abused, it's not the easiest thing to do to forgive the abuser. To enter into a relationship where those things aren't held against them because there's always uh, a fear at some level that that abuse would continue. Um, and, and we like to hope that, you know, through counseling and through prayer and through working with one another, that part of the past relationship can be overcome and forgiveness can be found. But for some people, um, that may be very difficult because that repentance, that changing, that recognizing that we have harmed someone and it's not appropriate and we shouldn't do that anymore, it never comes. Um, I want us to remember, though, that we as people of God don't believe that there is anything that is truly unforgivable. Because if, if there are things that we do that are truly unforgivable, that can never, ever, ever be overlooked or set aside so that it doesn't affect the relationship between a group of people, then what does that say then about the God who we ask to forgive us? There are things that people can do against me that are ultimately unforgivable, and I can never, without ever working toward it, consider them as anything other than someone who's harmed me. Then what about the ways that we fall short of God when we ask for God's forgiveness? Does that mean that to God there are things that are unforgivable in our life? Um, scripture tells us, no, there's only one thing that's unforgivable, and that is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which really means um, us saying that God isn't who God is, that God isn't the God of mercy, of love, of forgiveness, of resurrection. Um, by saying that God doesn't forgive, that God doesn't redeem, that God doesn't lift us up, we show ourselves that we're really unwilling to work at forgiveness. Joseph didn't just forgive his brothers overnight. He had 17 to 20 years to work at it. And so I think what we learn from that is 
in our life when we encounter people who have harmed us, or we in turn may harm others. Forgiveness, we can't expect it immediately. That's not fair. Forgiveness is about mending the relationship. And so what's important is that we work at it, that we continue to pray for the neighbor who has harmed us, that we continue to pray for ourselves, that we be given the strength to forgive, that we pray for the ability to overcome the things or the actions or the words that we've put out into the world that have caused harm to other people. And then, after that prayer and through that prayer, work to change the world around us so that forgiveness can happen. That doesn't mean that it may ever really come. We don't expect it immediately. But we work at it to make the world a better place and a better reflection of God's forgiveness for us in Jesus, just like we see in the relationship restored between Joseph and his brothers. And so as you go about your week, I ask people of God in the spirit of forgiveness, will you pray with me? Forgive our sins as we forgive good and gracious God. Give us the strength to come to one another in humility, confessing when we have done wrong, Encourage, pointing other people in the ways that they have wronged us. And in all things, joining together that through prayer, through works of service, and by following your example, we might know the depths of forgiveness which you offer to us through Jesus Christ. Bless us and keep us good and gracious God in all these things and all the things of our hearts which we lift before you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.